I'm Karina Love. I'm the chair of the Book of the Year committee, and welcome. Uh, this is tonight. We have author Ron Suskin speaking about his book Life Animated: A Story of Sidekicks, Heroes, and Autism. And uh, our event tonight is brought to you by the Cuesta College Academic Senate in partnership with the Slow County Public Library Slow Reads Program. And I wanted to borrow a phrase that I've been hearing about around campus a lot today, or this month, this year. Um, we're cultivating a community of readers. And I want to thank you for being part of that, that very important project. Um, our sponsors are friends of the Cuesta College Library, the Slow County Library, um, the Cuesta College Equity Fund. And I also wanted to thank all the folks that help put this together every year. And there are a few special things this year. Uh, it's 10 years of Book of the Year. We've been coming here doing this. Um, second amazing thing from this year is that we've been working with the Central Coast Autism Se uh, Center. And I wanted to uh, suggest that you look for their events that are coming up. The Art on the Spectrum Gala on April 14th and the Walk for Autism and Awareness Fair April 22nd. And I wanted to highlight a couple of the amazing events that we've had leading up to tonight. We have, um, I went to a really fun event um, where we learned about comic art, graphic novel art with artist Sydney Hall, and she's here tonight. And thanks to Denise Ray for, for coordinating uh, that event and a, and a lot of other um, art events that we had on campus this year. And also, I wanted to highlight the lecture series that we had exploring autism at the local libraries and here at Quest, a lot of amazing speakers exploring the issue. And um, so tonight, uh, we'll have our presentation by Ron Suskin, then we're going to have a Q&A. There's question cards that have been passed around, and there's also microphones, if you prefer. And then um, Ron will do some book signing, and then another great thing that we have this year is we have a reception over at the library, so if anybody, any of you would like to come over and talk to the author uh, more at, from 7 to 8 p.m., that's in the library at the center of campus. So welcome, everybody, and um, I'm going to bring up now Bailey Drechler, who's a faculty member here, and she's a member of the Book of the Year Committee, and she's going to introduce Rob. Can you tell by my face how excited I am to be here? <laughs> it is really such a pleasure to be able to do this introduction. And I don't want to mess it up, so I brought my glasses. Uh, even though I've written in 20 font, my nerves are getting the best of me. So as many of you know, Mr. Suskind's writing spans political investigation in such books as The Pride of Loyalty and The Way of the World, and also inquiry into the landscape of Washington, D.C.'s inner city schools, where we meet Cedric, a bright and determined young man intent on pursuing his higher educational dreams uh, in the book A Hope in the Unseen. For this book, Mr. Suskind was awarded a Pulitzer Prize. Tonight, Mr. Shuskine is here to discuss Life Animated. In this beautifully written, heartwarming, and at times heartbreaking memoir, Mr. Suskine chronicles the trials and the tribulations that autism has on his family, and especially on his son, Owen, who was given the diagnosis at the young age of three. There is a scene in the book during Owen's bar mitzvah where Mr. Suskine and his wife face attention all parents face, to love their child as he is, or to, quote, help him change so he can make his own way in an un unforgiving world, un end quote. In Life Animated, we enter this delicate dance of loving, accepting, guiding, and letting go, something we must all learn to do. Mr. Suskin shine, shares his journey, yes, of course, as a father, a husband, and a writer, but it is because Mr. Suskin is an attuned listener that we get deeper insights into the human spirit, reckoning with the challenges of the unexpected. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Suskin to the stage. That was 
lovely. I'm gonna take this mic off because you can't see me behind this podium, can you? <laughs> there you go, that's better. This is nice, this will be like Oprah. I'll walk down the aisle, we'll hug, we'll cry. Come together. You think she'd make a good president? I don't know, I'm confused. Yeah. Certainly make a much better president than. Like anyone could do a Trump hand. All right, so you got Nixon, Eldridge Cleaver, and Trump. It was like that, it's a little finger. I never thought I would be so glad to not be in Washington. As you know, I wrote four books on presidents, big noisy door stops, you know, 500 pages, you know, on, I wrote about Clinton, I wrote about Bush, you know, who didn't like me very much, and uh, Obama. And now I'm just witnessing this madness. I mean, my God, I, you know, I get calls from lots of Washington people, my sources, including lots of these folks, like John Brennan, the CIA chief, I know this guy, and all these people. I'm like, yeah, go. I mean, all these Bush people. I mean, they're livid. I mean, you know, I was beating the bejesus out of these guys. Now I'm hugging them. <laughs> what a crazy life we're living. <laughs> like, I was on, I had a moment, which, I, I mean, it's one that I feel very mixed feelings about, a bit of regret. I was on the Colbert show, on Stephen Colbert, on the, on the Late Show, um, just on the Thursday before the Tuesday election. All right, so Stephen wanted me on the show just before, the last show. And uh, because, you know, he, he said something, which, you know, he said, I've wanted to say this for years, is that in 2004, I picked up a piece that you, Ron, wrote in the New York Times Magazine. And it was a piece that had a famous quote in it, probably the sort of famous quote of the aughts, um, where someone from the Bush White House uh, said to me, we were kind of talking about um, truth, and we're talking about policy, and we're talking about the way the world works right now. And, and I said, well, uh, yeah, I understand message of this and that, but there are right answers. He's like, Ron, let me explain how the world really works now. See, Ron, you see, you're a member of what we call the reality-based community. I'm like, the what? <laughs> uh, if I'm a member of it, tell me what it is. You believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I'm like, yeah, what are you kidding? I've got a history behind me, age of reason, empiricism. No, no, I know, I know. But that's not the way the world really works now. You see, we're now an empire. And when we act, we create our own reality. The circles, the globe, three times before you have breakfast, it shapes behavior, assumption. What is truth after all? See, and now you'll study that judiciously as you will, you little RBCer. You know, it's kind of bad in the head. Reality based communitarian. <laughs> that will act again. You can study that too. That's the way you know all sorts. Now you see, we're history's actors because we will do what's necessary. And you'll be left to study what we do. I'm like, oh, baby. It's, I'll just tell you this as simply as I can. If you come to my office up in Northwest Washington, I've got a whole shelf of books. And in them, there are people who believe just what you said. And trust me, they end up in history's dustbin. Which is why I am honoring John Brennan, the former CIA guy, because in that tweet two days ago, he said flat out to Donald Trump, you will end up in history's dustbin. Trust me on that. <laughs> Look, I'm living a very weird life. And I want to mention someone I just spoke to a few minutes ago uh, because it sums it all up. This woman, Mary uh, Strobridge, is this right? A teacher. Okay, now Mary, uh, where's San Miguel? So she taught in San Miguel, she taught first, second, and third, mostly second graders. And then she was on the board of Cuesta at the college. Okay, so we're there chatting away, as I tend to before shows, get kind of fired up. And, um, and she talked about some Iraqi war veteran, is that right? 
uh, with a uniform who was once her second grader. And then he sees her and he calls for Mrs. Strode. I said, all right. So let me just tell you what happens. It's a, it's a weird thing to win one of these Pulitzer Prizes, okay? Because first off, you're all set. Uh, the, the dependent clause of your obituary is all written. <laughs> Ron Suskai, comma, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, comma. It was found alone in this apartment in South Florida. Um, that's where we Jews go, by the way. We don't, you know, we don't have a very clear conception of the afterlife, so we go to South Florida. A shuffleboard for all eternity. In a white patent leather belt. That is it. That is purgatory. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, when you win one of these things uh, back in the 20th century, it was it was weird. I mean, be because uh, you know it's in the newspaper, but not that day. It's like in the next day. No one knows anything until the next day when they pick up the newspaper. It was like the horse and buggy department. <laughs> so, so. Uh, on the next day, I got a phone call. And as soon as I heard the voice, I froze. Ronnie? I said, oh God, Mrs. Harker. 11th grade English. <laughs> I had not spoken to this woman, Mary, <laughs> since I was 18. I'm 34 at this point. But I mean, it was like she was in my head. You know, she's this woman's a presence in my life. She took me aside after school one day after class said, "You know, you could be a good student." I said, "Really? You think so? Yeah. You got some talents. Really? You just have to learn to write like you talk." Okay. That's my whole career right there. That was it. I said, "This is Harker." She's like, "Well." This morning, we were all in the faculty lounge together. We picked up the paper, and we said, he finally learned how to write a compound sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just chat. And there's a lot of catching up to do. I mean, you know, it's 17 years, and we're chatting away, and this and that, and I've got a family now, and this beautiful wife, and these kids, and I, I'm in Washington, I work for the Wall Street Journal, and it was just, it was just heaven to just tell Mrs. Harker everything. And, uh, and then, and then she, she said, you know, you can call me Betty now. <laughs> And I said, you know what, that actually kind of doesn't work for me. Um, <laughs> nothing personal, actually intensely personal, though, actually. You see, uh, let me explain, let me explain. See, okay, um, you see, you're Mrs. Harker up front, and I'm just one of the kids in the desk, so you, and you're teaching me what I need to know. You see, see and if you're not up there, then I, I don't get here and now. So... Thank you for calling, Mrs. Harker. And after that, I called her Betty. So, um, <laughs> became a friend, actually. We became friends as adults, which is kind of neat. So that was one thing that happened. The other thing, we'll get to our movie clip in a minute, is that they fly your family up uh, for the ceremony, the Pulitzer ceremony. And, uh, and they flew my mother up. <laughs> from Florida. She was living at that point in Boca, which is one of the key. She was living in a place called the Polo Club in Boca, which was named, interesting, after the long line of great Jewish polo stars. So. <laughs> I think of my great grandfather coming over from Russia, Polo. I don't know. What would you do? The horse, number one. What would you do with the horse? And that mouth. There's no second sale on that mouth. So, so they fly her up, and it's one of these moments where, well, you know, you'll never forget. Big, giant, baronial table, the ceremony, lots of notable people. She's across the table. I can't help her. <laughs> they say, Mrs. Susskind, would you like to say something? So she stands up. She's only five feet tall, so no one knew she was standing. But she was. She stood up. 
Look, you made no surprise. I mean, one on one, she can negotiate peace in Bosnia in front of a group. She freezes. So you're standing there, it's quiet for 10 seconds, 15. She says, okay, at this point, she's from Brooklyn. I suppose it's okay you didn't go to law school. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> she slays them. <laughs> and the guy next to me said, that's interesting. So it wasn't okay for you to be a journalist until after you had the Pulitzer Prize? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it gets a little bit to what Bailey just said about, about affection and sometimes the conditions that are attached to it. You know, look. She, 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 it was a very nice introduction, Bailey, but she wanted better than this for me, my mother. <laughs> she was hoping I was a lawyer. I know security. They wouldn't take such a capital risk to train to be a writer. It's dangerous. She told me early on, not so many words, but pretty much, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. <laughs> I just won't mention your name to other people. Just you know. <laughs> Which is kind of true, actually. <laughs> okay, come on. Years later, as a reporter, I'd be sitting with some mother. It's not a Jewish thing. All ethnicities apply. And, uh, and I'd say, we talked for a half an hour about the doctor. What about your other children? Yes, but let me tell you more about the doctor. <laughs> You want to make them proud. Give them something to talk about, right? It's America. The land of self-invention. Of reinvention. Of reaching. Well, that's part of the equation. The other part, very briefly, was her husband, my father. A guy to whom everything came so easily. Graced. He didn't have much ambition until he met my mother. He used to call her Shirley the Dominator Berman. <laughs> the Brooklyn College 115 pound edible wrestling champion. He became a life insurance man, not a lawyer, much to her chagrin. And he had to learn things, uh, surprising things. It came in very handy later in his life. Because, you know, he used to have to deliver death benefit checks to widows. Back in those days, only men got insurance as the breadwinners. Um, and, and so he sold life insurance. And periodically, he'd have to deliver those checks. And he would sit with this woman and at the kitchen table and talk about her future. This may be all the money you'll have for a very long time. And now what do we do? What do we do? This came in very handy. This understanding of life's passages. When he reaches from his bed to a night table at 46 years old, grabs the pad, and begins to write. In a great hand, a gifted writer. Always wanted to be a writer, actually. And he writes, I can't believe you two boys are my son. Me and my brother, we're teenagers. I'm overcome with joy when I look at you. Beyond expression, how can a guy be so lucky in this short life? Have kids like you. The kind of things we so rarely write or even say to our kids, to our loved ones. Talks about the values in his home. Those are values I took out into the world, and you have values from our home. And, and they'll be all you need. Take them into the world. They're like a vessel in which you'll sail. On and on, a page, then the second page. Why is he writing the way? Well, the first line says it clearly. I hope you boys never read this way, but I cannot ignore what the doctors have said. My chances of survival are slim. They were zero. What is doing to us posthumously per his instructions? At the end of the letter. You'll see in that last paragraph, the pen pressing harder on the page, kind of urgency. 
He says, but one thing I'll ask of you. Life is precious, time so precious. Do something worthwhile with your life. Don't compromise there, worthwhile. I love the construction of that word, worth for how long the while is, worthwhile. Keep that the star, the center of your constellation and everything will work, trust me. Paragraph before that, it says something that I didn't really understand in my brother as kids. Now as parents, we understand it maybe a little more. He says, you boys don't owe me and your mother anything. You've given us more of being a presence in our lives than we ever possibly could get to you. My mother disagrees with that almost at every level. <laughs> you owe me big, both of you. I work my fingers to the bone. You teenage boys alone, are you kidding? They're both right. Sun and moon. So that's the guy you're going to see in this clip in a minute. Doing the Peter Pan sword fight with my son, Owen. It's early on. We, uh, uh, I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal in the Boston Bureau. We've got two perfect children, or so we would say. We don't use that word perfect anymore. We did then. I'm married to this wonderful woman, brilliant, full of capacities that are foreign to me. I'm graced. We got this little starter house and it's all working out. And I'm reaching for all the things, well, that I'm taught to want. Reputation. A golden plaque. Things that will shine glory on me. That will give Cheryl, my mother, something to talk about at the polo club. <laughs> and then life intervenes. So, here's a clip to the movie, nominated for an Academy Award, called Life and a Movie. There is a boy who is just like other boys, until one night he sees from his window a storm on the horizon. Howie, oh, who are you? I'm Peter Pan, and you can. All of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. The doctor says, let me explain what autism is. Some of the kids don't ever talk again. I remember thinking, I'm just going to hold you so tight and love you so much that whatever is going on will go away. We're beginning to give up hope. And one day, we're watching the Disney animated movies. And he says, he doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. What the hell just happened? <laughs> and all of a sudden it became clear to us. He's using these movies to make sense of the world he actually is living in, our world. So at that point, we began to speak to him in Disney dialogue. When did you and I become such good friends? <laughs> Whatever works to get to Owen. <laughs> I've been scared my whole life of growing up. Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up because when you grow up, you lose all your magical childhood times. My hope is that he is independent enough to be able to grow older on his own. When I look in the mirror, I see a proud autistic man ready to meet a future that is bright and full of wonder. He's gonna have to fall and fail. We're not afraid of that as we used to be. I just can't believe how far Owen has come. The future, I'm still searching for it. Who decides what a meaningful life is? It's like I always say. Children got to be free to lead their own lives. I had were shattered. Shattered right there at the beginning of that trailer 23 years ago when Owen was diagnosed with autism. We just moved down to Washington. Big job for dad. 
senior national affairs reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Job got to kill people to get. And I killed 10 guys to get the job. I've got family man, nice guy. I was ambitious. I would do anything to win. I thought I knew everything. I knew it was important. And all of a sudden, we were turned on our heads. You know, I had a few hundred word vocabulary, two and a half years old, I love you, where's my ice cream? <coughs> I love Ninja Turtles, what a huge thing. All of a sudden, he loses all speech. A couple months in, he's down to a single word, juice. And Cornelia and I know this is, this is a disaster. What just happened to our guy? You see a doctor who says, you're out of my league, and you can see a specialist. And you see a specialist. And she uses the word autism. And I'm like, like the guy in Rain Man? My kid? She's like, well, maybe. He, Dustin Hoffman talks in that movie. And a lot of them won't get speech back when the regression is just traumatic. So last thing I heard in that doctor's visit. Cornelia and I literally lifted out of our bodies. We were looking down at the scene, both of us. The doctor there in her white smock. The parents in the chairs, Owen on the rug looking at his hands. We left those parents, we left those two in there. They did not leave with us. We used to miss them. Not anymore, it took a while. And off we went into life, we're still living. Now here's the twist. What does Shakespeare say? Sweet are the uses of adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, bears a jewel in its forehead. And all of life is struggle. What do you do when it hits you? Choice. A couple of different choices you might make. Right then we're just trying to survive. It just so happens. We made certain choices that worked out. We tried not to give in to despair. We tried to fix our eyes to say, he's still in there. We don't believe what people say about him. Because they were saying some tough stuff about him. <laughs> don't expect much. He will never have a life. Certainly not an independent life. You're going to have to support him for the next 50 years and 30 years after you're dead. Okay. Cut your hopes and losses. It's hard to not be hopeful. I think our natural state is hopeful, humans. When you lose it, you know that, you learn that. So Cornelia and I held tight to one another. You know, we took Walter's side, that was older brother, just two years older. She said, where did Owie go? And he was here, my buddy, and now he's gone. Well, he's still in there, Walt. Okay. We can't talk anymore. I know. But we're, we're making a bet, an act of faith that he's still our guy, just like he was. He's just, well, he's pivoted. He's made a turn in the road. Owen oh, couldn't talk anymore. We, um, we're in a kind of, kind of a mess. Now, interestingly, that book that Bailey mentioned, Talk Me Unseen, what happens there? I cross our town in Washington, D.C. just a month after he's diagnosed. Now I'm just gushing around on the floor. All my assumptions are gone. All my certainty, my knowing, that something I had paid for at the Wall Street Journal, mind you, to put that on the front page. I could be an expert in anything in two weeks. That's my job. Suddenly none of it seems to work anymore. So what do I do? I cross town in our little Johannesburg, which is Washington, to the other side of town. But he might came back from Bosnia, in fact. Roommate, mine from Columbia, Tony Harwich. 
he wrote a story about kids in Bosnia summoning hope, but there's no reason to hope. How do kids do that? I said, you know, that's what they do across town here in Washington, in the war zones of southeast Washington, just over there. I live in that little fertile crescent, northwest, where the lawyers and the lobbies and the journals who've made it to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal live. So I cross town, doing what? Searching for people who've been left behind, discarded. I don't even know why. I'm doing it. I end up at the worst high school in America, this blighted war zone high school, and I search for people who've been discarded to meet them. And I meet the kid, Cedric. The geek, pariah, nerd, called Whitey, Oreo. A pariah in that school. A target on his back. And I take him aside. We're up in chemistry. He got put out. He, he, was, a, he was copying, uh, someone was copying his homework. He got put out with the bunch of Bernies and the Beakers. And I said to him, I said, look, I've been here for about two weeks, and I'm a mess here. You know, in general, I'm a mess. I can't tell you why, but help me here. I just need to understand what it feels like to be you. Just, just for a day, just for an hour, so I can learn something, so I'll have something to write. Because, you know, I'm playing a game here. A game that is not authentic as a reporter. Teach me. He's like, I'm going to teach you. I have a question for you. Where did you go to college? I said, I, I went to University of Virginia. Oh, that's good. Some of you guys do some teaching, right? I said, oh, God. You do any teaching? Yes, I, <clears throat> I did some up in like, Cambridge. Cambridge! 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 You taught up at Harvard, right? I said, yeah. So I'm going to teach you? This is a scam. I'm not, not buying it. He gets up and he walks out. I chase him down the hall. I'm a desperate man. I say, Cedric, Cedric, just... Okay, look, I get it. I'm the worst thing in the world for you here in this... Yeah, you're right. Because in case you haven't noticed, you're white. That's bad for me here. I can't be seen with you. Okay, so I'll just stay 20 paces away and, and, um, and I'll listen. And then at night I'll call you up and you'll explain everything I'm seeing and teach me. I'm certain, certain, certain there are lights that I'm searching for under bushel baskets. That's my career. That's where it starts, really. <clears throat> I spent the next 20 years searching for left behind people, inner city America, the hollows of West Virginia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. The most dramatically left behind person I know is living in the bedroom. Oh, and deemed uneducable, cannot speak. And looking to me and Cornelia going, oh, and changed. But as importantly, we changed. That's what the book and the movie are about. The only thing he wanted to do was watch the Disney animated movies. That's all he wanted to do. That's all we did together. About a year into the silence, we're watching a movie called <laughs> The Little Mermaid. Anyone here see The Little Mermaid? Let's just show us. Every, everyone. You love that movie? Yes. What's your name? What's your name? Hey, give me a hand. Hey, Max, how are you, buddy? You love the mermaid, right? Yeah. Okay, so so let's do a Okay, let's let's do a s I'll I'll do let's do a scene. Okay. So there's a scene, okay? Here, here you stand up, Sam. Okay, so help me out here. Okay, Max? Yeah. Okay. So Max, there's a, a great scene of the little mermaid. Now now Owen couldn't talk at this point, but he's saying juicer bows uh, uh, just a, a couple weeks before we are watching this movie. Okay. Now, Cornelia thinks he wants more juice. She gives him the juice, and he knocks it over, doesn't want the juice. Now, we're watching a particular scene in which it's the Faustian bargain, where Ariel, can we talk about Ariel for a minute? She's kind of a selfish girl, isn't she, Max? Yeah, yeah. And she's working now with Goldman Sachs. She's fine. She's a partner. Uh, so, so she's got to make a deal with a sea witch. She wants to become human. Ursula. I'll be either. 
and, and, and to become human, she has to trade what? Her voice. Exactly. And, and the sea which says, it won't cost you much a trifle, really. She went and traded with her. Right, she says, and she says, just her voice. Just your voice. Exactly. Just your voice. We're watching it in the bed. Thank you, Max. Let's hear for Max. Thank you, Max. So what we're doing, we're watching the mermaid and that scene, okay, where Ursula says, oh, well, of course, I'm going to try for really just your voice. Owen rewinds it, you know, uh, then a second time, then a third time. Walter's like, Owen, oh, just watch the movie. And then Cornelia grabs me. It's not juice. It's just, I grab Owen, just your voice. And he looks at me for the first time in a year and says, juice or buzz, juice or buzz, juice or buzz. And Walter starts jumping on the bed. Are you, are you Max's brother? Okay. <laughs> well, the older brothers are key actors here. And Walter's jumping, oh, it's long again. And Cornelia begins to cry. He's still in there. And that's the beginning of what you see on the screen. He's seven years old when I do Yago. And after I do Yago, I say, what does it feel like to be you? Owen says, it's not good. I'm lonely and I have no friends. It's the first conversation we've had since that Peter Pan sword fight. It was two. And then we talked, the two of us together. Y Yago, the puppet, and Owen. He turns to the puppet like he's about to get an old friend. Of course, what happened? He memorized 50 Disney movies, all of them. So we're talking, Yago and Owen, and then he hear Owen clear his throat, <clears throat> and he says, I love the way your foul little mind works. That's Jafar, the villain. <laughs> the next line. Is that right, Max? Jafar. Oh, my. I see. I'll marry the princess. Marry the shrew. I said, oh, my God, we're talking to Disney dialogue. The next night, we start the basement sessions. That's how it worked. That's how it happened. This is now changing autism around the world. That's the way autism is now treated. Find what their passion is. Turn it into a pathway. They're really just like us. They're just intense and focused on their thing. You know, Isaiah Berlin, they're foxes and hedgehogs. You've heard that one? Well, you know, we're mostly foxes, especially these days when we're all suffering from ADD on a vast scale, right? There's too much stimulus. Folks on the spectrum are hedgehogs. They find their thing, they go a thousand feet deep. They turn it into a map, a mirror, a code breaker. That's what Owen does with Disney. Folks on the spectrum do with all kinds of passions that they have. So all of a sudden we realize he memorized 50 Disney movies. If you threw him a line, he'd throw you back the next line and he'd go for hours. So we go to the basement. Now we need the screen, that's like our script coach, all right? Because we do scene by scene. So the first one we do is Jungle Book. He loves Jungle Book. So uh, I, we all take characters. Um, Baloo, which works other than the hype thing, you know. <laughs> Bare necessities. Cornelius Bagheera, the protective panther. And you must go back to the Mad Mage. The jungle's dangerous. Walter's King Louie, the Orangu Day. <laughs> Tell me the secret of man's red fire, man, go. Oh, it was Mowgli. About seven scenes in, we freeze the screen, got it, everyone has their lines, we turn. And as Baloo, I say, you know, you'd make one great bear. And I said, do you think so, Papa Bear? He says, what? And then he hugs me. And I'm not sure if it's Mowgli and Baloo and me and Owen. Of course, Cornelia says, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, she's right. And that's how it happens. That's when we spend years in the basement. We start living a crazy double life. By day, we seem just like the rest of you. <laughs> We're going about our business. Walter, the brother of a sibling, of course, you know, the brothers of, of, of folks on the spectrum become, you know, little characters of Dickens. You know, I'm good, I'm fine. I don't, you're, you're busy, you're mom and dad, you got your hands full, I'm okay. No problems here. So he rides his bike to school in blizzards. <laughs> Cornelius taking Owen to every therapist who hangs a shingle, and I'm interviewing presidents. Some of them are not telling me the truth, not ever. 
come on, get your name over here. No, you can just say one over here. And at night, at night, we're meditating every night on the emergence of the hero. Over several years, Owen gets his speech back, different speech than when he was two. It's got a little extra rhythm to it, a little extra staccato beat. But his speech, he learns to read by reading credits, of course. <laughs> Emerges as a teenager, a unique actor. We'll do two jumps, and then we'll get to our Q&A. I continue to search for left behind people, informed by my son. So those characters live so powerfully in all those books. I started asking not just the hows or the whats or the whens, but the whys. Why is this person discarded? What decision was made? Where's that committee? We're going to ask the question in the movie that now is used as a point of discussion on campuses around the country after one meeting with some doctor who had dismissed Owen. He said, oh my, don't hope for much here. And he left, we're in the car. Almost everything happens in the car after doctor visits. <laughs> she says, who decides that? Who decides that he, he, he doesn't get a meaningful life, that he's not up to that? Where's that committee, damn it? Because I don't agree. That's our son. So those are the kind of questions I ask in those books and ask them of presidents. Who are the people we're forgetting? What is the job of leadership of of the duly elected government. How are civilizations judged? Of course, by what they do for their least fortunate. Of course. And those are questions that, in a way, Owen taught me to ask. So let's get back to our hero. So, Owen gets whacked. He gets thrown out of the school when he's 11. This is after about four years of the basement sessions. Now, he can't say enough to show his feelings, but he's getting a pretty good sense of the world. All right? And he's thrown out of this school, and he's, he, it's a disaster. You know, he doesn't deal with change well anyway, and he's bruised by this. You know, it's one of these things where everyone's moving from the elementary school to the middle school, and, they have, and they're all moving up, and they have a graduation ceremony. It's a, it's a school for special needs kids, mind you. A, a graduation for one person, Owen. So he's got the mortar board and the thing, and Owen is not fooled by this. And neither are the kids. They write a card for, to Owen and 100 years of Disney magic. Oh, and you will always be our hero. He comes home that day. We have a whole day planned. Ice cream and the video store, all his favorite stuff. And he says, no, I have to go to the basement. There's some movies I need to watch. He's down there a lot over the next month. It's like he's working on some kind of project. He keeps asking for pads. We don't know where the pads go. And he's down in the basement. It's, it's like, you know, it's interesting because he stands at the top of the steps of the kitchen before he descends, and he says, hold all calls, and he goes to the basement. <laughs> we checked. It's never been said in Disney. We had to go. We watched 40 movies. It was never said. What's it hurt me saying? I don't know. Maybe Cornelia. So about a month in, I go to the basement. Walter and, uh, and Cornelia are out. It's a rainy day. And I go down, and I see there's a pad in the middle of the floor, in the den, in the basement, right next to the big TV. Owen's upstairs. I open the pad up, and I see... Max, the face of Sebastian the Crab. That look when Ariel loses her voice. Ariel, no! And another one. Another one. Does he flounder? Does he Cogsworth, the mayor? Keep flipping the pages. There's a hundred pictures drawn with enormous precision, just like an animator. All sidekicks, no heroes. 
bring the book to Cornelia that night. She's like, where are the heroes? Simba, Aladdin, all sidekicks. We go down and talk to Owen. He said, hey, we found that book. Wow, you're a great artist. I'm a really good artist. All sidekicks, that's right, all sidekicks. I'm a sidekick, I'm not a hero, I'm a sidekick. He sees our faces sag. So no, 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 the sidekick is important. They help the hero fulfill their destiny. Without them, nothing happens. Oh, like, yeah, actually, yeah. Last two pages of the book, written in a scrawl, badly spelled, two things. I am the protector of the sidekicks. And the last thing he writes, no sidekick gets left behind. Owen sensed the judgment of the world and he had his response. He turns the whole house into the land of the lost psychics. We all have psychic identities. Cornelia's either a big mama from Fox and the Hound, it's Pearl Bailey, or Mrs. Potts from Beauty and the Beast. She's not that happy about Mrs. Potts. I'm either uh, uh, Rafiki or Merlin. Now, if I get that on Father's Day, a perfectly drawn Merlin, I know it's been a good year for me. The only one in the house drawn as a hero is Walter. So years into this land of the lost sidekicks, which goes on for years, Walt's about 17, Owen's about 14, and Owen is talking about the return of traditional hand-drawn animation. Now the fact is, you know, we say what parents say, which is nonsense. You know, we don't want to tell them the truth. Oh, you bet, Owen, hand-drawn animation will come back. You betcha. Walter looks at the two of them like, who are these parents? <laughs> oh, and look at me, buddy. Listen, to me. this is dinner. I mean, since Toy Story 1995, hand drawn is toast. They put out three computer animated movies a week. It's easy to do. You're the only one who cares so much. Owen's oh, face says, no one knows this. All he does is troll animation sites all day. Now, Walt does an extraordinary thing. He says, okay, buddy, all right. You want hand-drawn animation to come back? You gotta lead the charge. Come on, you been watching these movies since you're a little peanut. You got any ideas in there? He's being challenged by the only hero in the house. And no one says, I have, I have, one, I have one idea. <sighs> Dinner table goes quiet. I mean, and we know not to rush him. So we're quiet for about a minute. You can see it bubbling up. He says, you know, 12 sidekicks searching for a hero. And in their journey and in the obstacles they face, each finds the hero within themselves. And between classes to sidekicks. Those come up the present tense. Have you seen that trailer? There's the... Uh, a little animation in the middle. Well, that actually is an animated seven-minute short called The Land of the Lost Sidekicks. That's Owen's original movie. I'll tell you something. In the meritocracy I was raised under, that I came to trust, that was the bequest of my beloved mama, Owen was in the discard pile. He couldn't hit the belt. Not ever. Couldn't even be in the game. Well, thank God that I was taught something bigger than what I had been taught. Against my will, mind you. These are deeper truths. We're lucky we get to feel their warmth, get to see the light of them come our way. Oh, and nowadays, he's fulfilling a kind of idea. And it's not that he's different. In fact, up on the screen, 40 feet tall, he seems like one in a million. He's not. 
as any parent of any person on the spectrum knows, he's one of millions. They're everywhere. He goes to a school up in Cape Cod, all right? Riverview School. It's in the movie. It's in the book. All right? Uh, uh, Cornelia and I, I'm at Harvard at that point. I'm the writer in residence, which is one of these you know, do-nothing jobs. That Harvard gives out a lot of those. So we're an hour away from the Cape. Owen gets to college, this college-like program. It's, it's college-like. Their dorms and their activities, and it's lighter academics. And of course, as soon as he gets there, what does he do? He starts Disney Club. It's like, there's only way I'm going to make friends. He's going to start Disney Club. And he starts it, and we're ecstatic. You know, he's never even been in a club. Now he's the president of Disney Club. <laughs> so Cornelia and I are all over him. We're calling him every other day. How are things going in Disney Club? What are you doing? He's like, we're just, we watch movies and eat popcorn. No, oh, and you're the president. You're the president. Now I sound like my mother. <laughs> That's big. That's huge, huge. You got activities, and you have to do things, and oh yeah. So about eight months into this, he's like, I talked to one of the dorm counselors, they say, you can have parent advisors to Disney Club, so you and mom want to come. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's uh, 72 miles from Harvard <laughs> Square to Cape Cod. We did it in 44 minutes. Um, <laughs> We get to Disney Club, first night's Dumbo. Nice choice. Now Owen, here's the way it works. They watch a movie, Owen has presidential powers, which is his thumb on the rewind button, on the remote. <laughs> he owns the remote. So they stop at the key scenes and discuss the meaning. And right there, Dumbo jumping out of that tall tower with the magic feather. And the feather all of a sudden starts to come out of his trunk. And Timmy's like, Dumbo, the feather's just a kid. You can do this. Believe in yourself. Dumbo! Freeze. Around the room they go, oh, hope. How do you stay hopeful? There's 12 kids just like him there. Look at Kang. I see a girl in the corner looking with enormous intensity at the screen. I'm like, hi, what's your name? Well, what, what? I said, you love this movie. Oh, I love Dumb my number one, Dumbo. I said, okay, why Dumbo? Okay, okay, she says. Well, you see, I, um, mm, I didn't talk for a long time, and Dumbo doesn't talk. Mm. And then I figured out what the movie was about. You see, Dumbo's an outcast, and I was an outcast. I grew out of my life into high school. And, um, but the thing that made him an outcast, those ears, you see, uh, the thing that made him different turned out to be his greatest strength and allowed him to soar. And that's the way it is with me. That's why I'm a Dumbo girl. <laughs> this is all Owen needs to see. That's his girlfriend, Emily. That's it. That's the one for me. <laughs> you know, let's, let's be frank here. Are you getting more than that on 10 dates of small talk? Are you kidding? <laughs> this is a statement of purpose and identity. Disney Club. So, okay, that's the first year. By the third year, there are eight couples in Disney Club. <laughs> Seven boy girl, one boy boy, and they're having a ball. <laughs> now, what's interesting, at the ends of all the movies, all of a sudden in the half light, you see everybody go. <laughs> and there you see it. The form is perfect. Arms akimbo, chin up, head tilted. All in the Disney kiss. It's beautiful. So nowadays, Owen travels with us. Not as much as he did. We we're two years ago, in 2016, actually, we won the award in Sundance. And then we start to go on the road. The family, four of us, it was lovely. And uh, he still does some shows. And he did a show about eight months ago where he kind of said it all. The last thing I'll say. You know, it's a big crowd. Someone asked him, Owen, what's it like to be a celebrity? Now they know about his issues with the hero. As Owen has said, who decides that that's the hero? I mean, they usually decide in the third scene of every Disney movie, right, Max? 
when the hero sings the I Wish song. I want adventure in the great white somewhere back. I want to live part of your world, Ariel. Who decides that, that that's the hero? And everyone else is the sidekick. Owen's question. But now, oh, look at the. Oh, and how does it feel to be a celebrity? She says, I'm not a celebrity, I'm a person being celebrated. They're different. Pretty good. <laughs> Now we're all on the stage with them, and we're like, is he going to take the bait? Because clearly the questioner, well-meaning, is trying to nudge it over into the embrace of the role of hero. So, no one stands there. Goes another minute, he put, in silence. All right, something I'm thinking, give me a minute. It's exactly a minute. 59 seconds, he speaks. You see... I think we're all really sidekicks at our best when we help others fulfill their destiny. And on that day, we find our inner hero. But we're really sidekicks, and we don't get redrawn in this life. Not really. You know, that's a definition of heroism that I can feel us all embracing. So powerfully participatory, so different than the one we're sold on the covers of magazines. That CEO there with the cap teeth, <laughs> did it all on my own. <laughs> Which is why my constant compensation is, un is appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> no one does anything on their own in this country, or any country. People say, Betty Harker, my teacher Mary. That's true. That's not fake news. <laughs> That's real news. And the thing about this definition of heroism is it's a choice. That's the beauty of it. It's a choice we make every morning when the sun rises. Can I help someone else fulfill their destiny and I, in that way, fulfill my own? So a few minutes ago, I called Owen up. I was talking to him before the show. Said, where are you, Dad? I said, I'm in California. Where? So it was a piece of, yeah, it's about uh, two hours and 40 minutes from San Francisco and three hours from Los Angeles. That's right. <laughs> Compensatory strengths. <laughs> Here's the way our brains really work. For every deficit, the brain creates an equal and opposite strength. Period. These things are very plastic between our ears. That's what we know now. It's not that old frontal lobe, this left hemisphere, that. That's all pop. Some of us are dramatic combinations of deficits and strengths. <laughs> He's got compensatory muscles. I have some too. Everyone does. He says, so uh, what kind of a crowd? I said, they're book people. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so they read the book. I said, some of them have, and some seen the movie, and some will. Okay. Yeah, they're book people. Are right? they? Are they mostly old people like you and me? <laughs> Are there an older crowd? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you, I said, can I do a voice? Which voice should I do? Now, he's got literally thousands of scenes in his head. So he basically goes to the great matrix and he picks out a scene. Now, I know most of the scenes too, because we do them together as part of our expressions of love and caring. And, you know, dealing with adversity and all the rest. He says, well, okay, well, these people are kind of your guys' friends. <laughs> and so you should do love business with them. Now, this is a scene that many of you don't know. It's from a movie called Sword in the Stone, 1963. I love this movie. It's not one of the bigs, okay? 
It's just the story you know, one of the iconic, it's Merlin and Arthur. Merlin's the wizard, Arthur's a boy. And there's a key moment in the film where they are turned into squirrels by Merlin and his magic, and they bump into two lady squirrels, and there's some things that go on. You know, very PG, but the things happen between the squirrels. They, the squirrels clearly like the two squirrels, these two really humans as squirrels. And then Merlin says, enough already, and turns them both back into humans. And there's this little girl squirrel sitting now on Arthur's lap. Oh. She comes at the top of the tree. She's not a squirrel, this is a boy. Arthur looks up, oh gosh. And he hears the squirrel cry. He and Merle start to walk off together. Arthur's perplexed. Merlin, the teacher. And Merlin, one of Owen's very favorites in his top ten, says, you know, boy, this love business is a powerful thing. Greater than gravity? Well, yes, my boy, I, I believe it's the most powerful force on Earth. So Owen says to me, tell them about love business, and I send love to each and every one of those people. So, thank you all. Okay, let's do some questions here. We've got mics on either side. Uh, over here is a mic. So, oh, look, I'm a journalist, I love questions. So, and you can just yell it out if you want. It's not that big a room. Okay, who's got one? How's Walt doing? He's doing great. Okay, thanks for asking. So, so the beauty of Walt is that Walt is like the uh, proxy for the audience. You know, he's, he's, you know, the class president. He's captain of the football team. I know, Cornelia has normal-sized people in her family. So, um, <laughs> and you know, and, and in a way, he's the person everyone looks to as to what will he do through the movie and the book, too. You know, I mean, it's not easy being the brother. You know, Cornelia and I, again, are blind to everybody. We're like, Walter, we're just like every other family. Now, that doesn't work, really, but we still say it. We're in the diner, and we sit in a corner booth, so everyone won't stare at Owen. And Owen's literally, like, spinning salt shakers on his head. And Walt's like, oh, my God. Walter, we're just like everyone else. Are you crazy? <laughs> I got a whirling dervish from Disney sitting next to me. The key scene in the book, the way you hear me and Cornelia, we kind of wrote it together, telling ourselves a bit of who we are. You know, Walt's. Six years old, Owen's four. He's into silence about a year. And Cornelia's taking Walter to school. It's just Walt Owen and Cornelia in the car. I'm away somewhere on the trip. First day of first grade. About 500 yards from the school, Walt says, Mom, you can just leave me off here. <laughs> Cornelia's like, Walter, they know you have parents. This isn't Dickens. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, how do you now, of course, we turn that into story. We, it's not just because we're writers. Everyone does that. We shape everything into narrative. That's what these brains do. You know, so that's part of our story about Walter. Independent, the Jewish Marine. It's the beach feels guilty, goes back. And he'll do anything, and he can do it on his own. Doesn't need us. Well, when I'm writing the book, of course, I've got to talk to Walter about this moment. Oh, yeah, your mom, that was all your whole Jewish Marine shtick. <laughs> Let me tell you what's really going on, Dad. It's just me, Owen, and your mom. And if mom brought me in to school, she'd have to bring Owen in. And then it would be, well, what's going on with your brother? You know, six year old boys are a cruel bunch. What, what would it have to be about that? Look, you know, I take a bullet for the kid, you know that. You know? Does he always have to you know, be here? It always has to be about him. 
That's the way reality works. You know, all his kids, his whole life, he gets more love from mom and dad. He gets more time. Of course, the beauty of it, Walt evolves through this trauma of 20 years. He gets to this lovely point. He's 22 years old. He had to go to a camp up in New Hampshire. Ends up being an only free zone. No one knew about his brother. Walt achieved so mightily at this camp. It's like the greatest camp forever. We're all like, wow. What's he not getting at home that he's getting up here? Well, it's because he got to reinvent and restart. As though this had never happened. So 10 years in, he's a counselor now. And, and another counselor, who's been a camper and then a counselor with him, he knows this guy for 10 years, says, hey, well, you know, one of your advisees, I, I talked to him today, he has not one autistic brother, but two. Well, it's like, really? You never told me that? Oh. So the next week, the counselors, well, they have to stand up and give something called a tree talk. It's just kind of like, it's not a sermon, it's kind of wisdom acquired. And Walt has to do his tree talk. And he says, it's about time you knew about the best teacher I ever had. It's my brother. Now he's taught me more about Disney than even the people who make the damn movies know. <laughs> but he's taught me a lot beyond that. You see, um, what he accomplishes in a day with what he faces is more than I can accomplish in a month. Whatever the world throws at me, it's, it's nothing. <laughs> All right, people say, oh, that's the blessing in disguise, right? He also says something quite pointed. There's nothing disguised about it. It's plain as day. And it's our inability to see it. There it is, look, right there in front of you. So Walter is actually, oh, he tells us some years later, the protector of the psychics. We didn't know Owen wanted to be like Walter. We said, Walt's so different. He's not going to use Walter as a model, but he did. And Walt now? Well, a couple things. One, it's kind of nice. When the Los Angeles Times read a profile of the boys, they had a line uh, saying, and the movie marks the emergence of, um, of uh, a rare documentary heartthrob, Owen's brother, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a good couple of years for Walt. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> and he worked for an agency that's been defanged and disemboweled recently called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's the one Elizabeth Warren started. He was a spokesman and speechwriter uh, for the director. Um, and uh, when he saw the agency going down in flames, he said, well, I'm actually going to do the thing I really want to do. And he had started an organization called Sid Strong, for siblings, uh, a national organization uh, for siblings of folks who are differently abled. So that's our boy Walt. Okay, another question. How about you back there? Hey, stand up, what's your name? My name is Tim. Hi Tim, I'm Ron, nice to meet you. Speak to me. Well, sometimes when I'm watching the movie The Lion King, yes. Let's hear it for Tim right there. That's a brilliant, brilliant. That Tim. That Tim is, of course, the great Rafiki. Rafiki the baboon. You can either run from your past or face your past. Simba. 
What does Mufasa say just a few scenes later? Simba, you are more than what you become. Oh yeah, hey, what a rip. Hey, um, I wanted to uh, ask, I saw the movie once and I know that you were, uh, I know you were like in there, the room when he was drawing the stuff, but I was wondering if he used references or you just drew it by uh, visual image. Uh, like, Because I want to know, because I sometimes challenge myself and try to draw things uh, without a reference because it's a challenge. Um, yeah. And uh, What's your name, what's your name? Uh, Jake. Jake, how are you? Yeah, Jake? Yes. Good. How are you? So, uh, so are, are are you an artist? Uh, kind of. I am a studio art major mm -hmm. here, and I'm almost done. Yeah. But it's a competitive field, and I might come back at some point or just try to chill and love life. Yeah. Well, um, chill your there's way other life. ways. There's other ways you can be successful. And, and not, you know, and the beauty you know, is, is if you're an artist, you're still an artist. Yeah. Whether they pay you for it or not, that is who you are. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what Owen feels. And well, just to answer your question. What he does is he finds an animation book at the start, and he looks yeah. at the picture, and he draws it precisely. It's like one of those, you know, two pencil things. Uh, now we can draw many of them without the image, because he, he, they're photographed in his head. Yeah. But in a way, it's still from that image. I really liked his, uh, his artwork of Zazu from The Lion King. Yeah. Because uh, well, it was original, I uh, noticed some features on him that wasn't really from the Disney film. I love you saying on, that. The thing on his nose, like the nostrils on him, yep. I really liked that. It was, it made it look well, that's like so, original, you know? It's, it's only an artist that would see that. I mean, because yeah. what he does is he, he takes the iconic drawings and he adds a flourish. And that's why the folks at Disney love these drawings, because they're like, they're in a way a little more vivid than we drew them for the movie. But why? Because Owen feels their emotions more vividly. He's yeah. living in their skin, which is what the great artists do. Yeah, and I, you know, I usually draw like all my favorite characters or try to draw like, I really like Pokemon and I always try to draw like all my favorite Pokemon without like looking. And I've learned how to draw Greninja just by, by visual image and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. And um, I'm also a musician and a uh, gamer and I feel like when I finish school, maybe trying to see if I could do something like that, you know. Um, something along those lines, but it, like, it still makes money with like music and gaming and you can still make your own art too for advertisement. We're and, living in an extraordinary democratized age. Yes. When you don't have to be the one in a million to get some art in a gallery or get something published. Uh, we're living in, in a kind of Gutenberg moment. Yes. Where folks can express their ability and their art and their expression of self in a thousand ways that lasts forever and is yours. And that's yes. what I hope I hope you do that. I want to do it. I'm working on it, working towards it this year. Well, let, so let's everybody give a hand to an artist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to look at some of these questions here. And um, let's see if we got a good one. Um, okay, I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> What would you like to see offered to kids on the autism spectrum to help find their compensatory strengths? Great question. Okay. Who asked that question? Can I see that person? Right here. Hey, nice question, man. Uh, up there. What's your name? Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Thank you for this question. Okay. So here's the amazing thing, and this is an amazing story, and it's kind of a magic trick because it's something that we've learned since the book came out. Right? We always knew, as I said, that Owen's not one in a million, he's one of millions. But what's happened since the book's come out is that autistic spectrum folks from around the world have reached out to us. Not just the parents, the individuals themselves, both of them, really. And they said, okay, look, I'm a Harry Potter guy. I'm medieval poetry. I'm astrophysics. I mean, it's a thousand compensatory strengths revealed through the affinity. Affinity is the Susskind's fancy word for intense interest. Because for years, these interests were seen as obsessions in autism. And that's just wrong. 
we essentially proved that it was already teetering and we kicked it over. They're just passions. I have them, you have them. The folks on the spectrum, though, use them, need them, rely on them. Just like artists do. Just like our friend the artist does. They, they draw the DNA of all things from everything. And it's through their passion, the affinity. And that's where their compensatory strengths are revealed. That's a beautiful equation. So what we did was after the book came out, we were avalanche with these calls of parents first saying, I get it now. I mean, I thought that I should cut it off. You know, this thing that he's always watching or doing. Now I know I've got to get there with them in there. And I'm like, yes. But then they're saying, how do we do that? Right? So after about 100 of these calls, because, you know, a lot of the parents said, look, I work and my wife works, and we're not crazy storytelling types, and I'm an accountant. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> so, well, we're right. It, precisely. So we. So what happened was, very quickly, we're out on Cape Cod at Owen's two-year love anniversary with Emily, the girlfriend. And I was, mind you, for many years, folks on the spectrum were seen as not having any emotional valence because they couldn't show the emotions in traditional ways. Owen and Emily had a two-year anniversary of their first kiss. That's like a pair of romance poets in the back seat of the car, mind you. So they're back there. Cornelia and I are driving them around, and Emily starts playing with Siri on her cell phone, on her on her iPhone. And Owen goes, "What is that?" And Emily says, "This is Siri." Owen, everyone knows what this is. And she asks the funny questions. And then Owen says, "Can you ask it anything?" Cornelia nudges me in the front seat. I'm like, "What a great idea!" Yeah. So, buddy, if you could ask Siri anything, what would you ask it? Owen ticks off 15 things he would ask Siri if he could ask it anything. Well, Cornelia and I have the answers to 11 of them in the front seat. The other four you can find on the internet. And then Owen says, now, of course, it's connected to the internet, right? So all my clips are in. There are all 10,000 of them. That's good. Because, you know, I've got them connected to all these parts of my life. <laughs> Little light bulb went off. Next week, we're out in the West Coast, and I grabbed the guy who is the inventor of Siri. It's a guy. It's a nice Jewish guy. It was good for me. <laughs> and my guy, hey, my wife was your boss. Good. I signed some books for him, and we spent the day together in a diner. And he said, Cornelia and I have been up nights for the last week. We know what we need. We need a shapeable Siri we can feed and direct, and at night correct. Because, you know, we know Owen, and, and we can build the support in this Siri that we can shape ourselves. He's like, that's a good idea. You should file a patent on that. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and here's the cool part. He was leading that patent filing. Owen Susskind. <laughs> He's got his own patent number. And damn well he should. <laughs> so we built a new technology called Sidekicks. What does it do? When I type or talk into my iPhone, it comes from the voice of a character on a paired phone. Oh, we can talk to her just like I'm talking to you. He can do the same for me. And here's the cool part. When I search for anything on YouTube, it mirrors in real time on his phone. Or him to me. So we can watch all of his favorite stuff together. I can unobtrusively, through the sidekick, through the avatar, enter his world. I can figure out why he's using this for whatever, as a code breaker, as a thing to support him, as an anxiety reliever. Compensatory strength. And when you get into that underground cavern, you see really the abilities that are otherwise masked. That's how we're doing it. And on the internet, on YouTube and on the internet generally, all their affinities can be fed. All those compensatory strengths can be revealed through the passions which can now be found on the miracle device. So that was the way we answered your question as a family. And now Sidekicks, if you go to Sidekicks.com, it's a free app. You can download it and do exactly what we did wherever you are, even if you don't have 10 years to spend in the basement watching Disney movies <laughs> with a notepad. So that's really hopeful. Is it only in English? Right now it's in English. You want to translate it to some other language? I'm all for that. 
you're on. Because, you know, the movie is now opening in China, live animated, and we're getting calls from China. How do we do this? We get it. But it's so hopeful. It's so hopeful. Because what's happened is people's eyes have adjusted. You know, the first page of the book, or the first minute of the movie, that opening screening at Sundance, we heard every breath in the room. And you could hear people go, oh, right, that's autism. I've seen that. Almost 25. He's walking around. He hasn't shaved in two days. He's doing some voice. And then that little lady's in there like, he memorized 50 Disney movies? I can't do that. And then midway, Walter and he have a Birds of the Beast call, which is a riot. <laughs> Everyone laughs. And Cornelia grabs me in the theater and says, they saw him as diminished as less. They wouldn't laugh. They never did. But they didn't by then. They saw him as different, not less. And that's what's happening here. It's what always happens at great moments of social justice. Other is seen as us, not them. And we move one little step forward. So I just want to finish with a question from Max because he's been my partner here from the start. Okay, here, come here. What's your name? James. James? James. Oh, I think James is a cool name, too, though. <laughs> what a name. Hey, James. Hey, yeah, I love that. Okay, James. Autism, nothing's wrong with them. Like uh, it was said in the Hercules movie, I can go the distance. One of Oprah's favorite songs, I Can Go the Distance. Oh. James, I love that. If our members strive to have fun social activities, reduce negative stigmas, and advocate and establish an environment of friendship and unity. Through this, our goal is that participants grow and flourish socially in the Cuesta College community and beyond. I have autism myself. I do too. I love it. So we have the joy of finishing this night by celebrating two special people and defining what special really means. Just what it says. Special. Let's hear it for our audience. Thank you all for coming out. You know, I, I just want to say that nights like this fill the hearts of, of the Susskind family. I mean, truly. You know, years ago I was with the boys in the car and Martin Luther King's birthday. Again, we had changed by then. We are driving. And now. Uh, an old grainy tape came on from NPR. Now, as you can tell, I'm an NPR listener, in case you're wondering. <laughs> it was from a, a long ago speech King gives in 1961, you know, Southern Church. It's a grainy tape. Where King says, in this movement, this movement we are in, we will sing a song, we shall overcome. Now, in the old Baptist churches of the South, it was always, I shall overcome, a statement of individual testimony. But it should be we, because we will need each other in what's ahead. Because we will be reviled, we will be spat upon. Some of us may have to suffer physical death to press against the death that comes from ignorance and bigotry and racism. You can almost hear in the church the room go quiet like King had dropped his sword and you can hear him pick it back up. He says, be not deterred. All that he knew then 
and was right was ahead. He said, be not deterred, you see, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's where he says it. I mean, you could put that in any testament of your choosing. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I'm in the front seat driving, and I start bawling. <laughs> and the kids are like, what is that crying? And Cornelia's like, it's okay, boys, it's progress, it's fine. <laughs> and this phrase knocks around in my head for months. And it dawns on me. That arc does not bend on its own. It bends because people of shared purpose grab it and pull with all of their might. And I feel might in this room. Be strong for truth and for justice and for love. Thank you all.